I'm here to redeem the time. That's what I want to be talking about to you this morning for just a little bit. Redeeming the time. Just in the, as the song said earlier, Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize, the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. Paul had every single degree, every single uh, uh, thing that you could look at and say, wow, that man knows a lot about the Lord. He just has so much knowledge. He said, I was a Pharisee touching the law. He said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin. He was pretty much the, the next man set up to lead all over the Pharisees in Israel. But he said, I count it all as done to follow Christ, that I may win Christ, that I may know him. You with me this morning? You in here this morning? That I may know Christ. That's what he said. He didn't say that I may know a, a, a new way to, to teach and a new way to ex explain what this means and this means about the histories of the Bible. I, I think there's a great deception going on right now in the church. Too many people are studying about the Bible and not the Bible itself. Too many people are worried about the historical facts and the intertestamental things that may be true and that can help us understanding. But the truth is that can become an idol. Paul had all that down. Not all that we have today, but he had in that time frame the same stuff wrapped up in the pharmaceutical, all that type of knowledge, if that's even a word, pharmaceutical. But uh, he, he had all the knowledge that you could ever dream. Probably had the Old Testament memorized. Who knows? But he said, I count all the law keeping done. I count all what I was doing for men to see me and to please me, and I count it all as loss that I may win Christ. There's some things that the church needs to count as loss to find Christ as gain. We're holding on to some things because we want to please people, because we want to be seen, all these things. We have to come to a point where we let all that stuff go to see others saved, to glorify Christ, because that's why we're still here. We're here to redeem the time. We're not here to be seen. We're not here to make money. We're not here to do this and that for us to get fame. We're here to be an example of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one who arrested death in our lives, as the song said earlier. So we show Him to the world. And if we're not, well, we're going to see how we can today. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, verse 15. And I just want to say one more time, thank you all for welcoming me today. It's an honor and privilege to be before you. Let's start in verse 14. Wherefore, he says, Awake you that sleeps, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for who you are today. We thank you for showing up in our lives when we were at rock bottom, Lord, when we our face was turned from you. You came and turned us around in our sin, and you reached down and plucked us out of it by your mighty right long arm, Lord. You reached down into that sin and pulled us out by your grace, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for what you've done at Calvary for us, how you've displayed the greatest love to cleanse us from our sin and to now help us to live in this grace and to live victorially into you, Lord. We thank you for who you are today once again and what you've done, and we ask that you do that same thing here today, Lord, that your word would go forth today like a two-edged sword, Lord, or as a comforter, whatever is needed, you know, Lord. I ask that you would help me to draw your truth out of your word today. Anoint me to preach and anoint the people to hear and listen that we all may know and learn of you more today and grow in you, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Uh, this has been on my heart for a long time now, redeeming the time. <clears throat> I've been studying this and in Colossians where it says the same thing, walk in wisdom toward those who are without, redeeming the time. There's many places that talks about it, but... This passage of Scripture here in verse, 15, in verse 16 says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. This was nearly 2,000 years ago. 
Paul wrote this to the Ephesians. Nearly 2,000 years ago, he wrote this to the church who had just newly been formed into an evil world. And now, I think we all know and can see the situation that we're in in the world. So how much more today should, be, should we be redeeming the time? Amen? But we don't see that. I believe we see it the opposite. I believe we see the opposite zealousness that the early church had. Why is that? Why do we see a, a, a totally almost falling away of witnessing for Jesus out, out beyond the four walls of the church? It's not enough just to come and to sit on the pew and to get edified and to grow and learn from Pastor Matt each week because I know you do. I know you hear the Word of God preached here. I know you hear the Gospel preached. But it's our responsibility to take it in our heart and to take it out into the world. You will go places that I never get to go, and I will go places that you never get to go. We're called to be a light in, this, in these last days. We're called to redeem the time. And how can we redeem the time if we're not living like we're redeemed? Amen? Amen? That's what we're called to do, redeem the time. Can you all still hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Let me open this up today. We're called to redeem the time. And what does that mean exactly, redeeming the time? Purchasing the time back. We know what redeeming means. We were redeemed. And the only way we can do this is if we're living redeemed, is if we're preaching the message that redeemed us and we're living the message that redeemed us. That's the only people who were truly redeeming the time. <clears throat> I saw a video a, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was less than that, about a week ago, of a young evangelist um, who travels around and preaches and he was in a pulpit just screaming and shaking and shouting and running and almost falling backwards and doing backflips and you couldn't understand a word he was saying. Mm. And that's not redeeming the time. <laughs> okay, That's not redeeming the time that's wanting to be seen. And that kind of stuff needs to be said and sometimes it's hard to hear. But redeeming the time is not putting on a show for right. the people. Right. <clears throat> Redeeming the time is preaching the only message that will allow God to show up in someone's life when they believe it and pull them out of sin and sorrow. Amen. Pull them out of a road to hell, a road to death that we've all been on. Amen. You see, if somebody would have came preaching that <laughs> to me, I never would have been redeemed. Right. It's our job to preach the Word of God in the context of what Jesus did at Calvary. Because you see, without the Bible, without Jesus, the Bible is just another book. Amen. And a lot of people don't like that when it's said, but that's the truth. That's right. <clears throat> we have no relation to God without Jesus, and we have no relation to Jesus without what He did on the cross for us. You see, if He wouldn't have died for our sins, He still would have been God, but He wouldn't have been God to you and me. You get that? He still would have been God, but He wouldn't have been God to you and me. We wouldn't have been in relationship with Him without being able to come close to Him and be cleansed of our sin. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> That's what it's all about. Why are we preaching anything else if that works? Amen? Amen. I always like to say it like this. If I still sin and I still stumble, and I do, and I will until the day I die, and so will you, then I need to keep hearing the answer. Amen. Not just once, not just twice a year, not just three times. Listen, there's a myth that we just lay a foundation of the message of the cross and move from it. That's nowhere in your Bible. We just lay a foundation of Christ crucified and start preaching a whole slew of other things. There's nothing else to preach. He's right. There's nothing else that can give you life. If you open up this book and begin to read and relate it to your life, to my life, and you never mention Jesus or what He did, where's the power to apply? Amen. Right. The truth is you have to talk about Jesus. Amen. You have to talk about His blood, not just because you have to say certain words. You don't have to use certain terminology and, and phraseology. But if you're preaching out of this Bible here, and you want to relate it to my modern day relevant situation, then you must also relate it to Jesus Christ. Because without Him, I have no relation to this book. I call it the Jesus book. 
My dad's called it the Jesus book, and I've kind of stole that phrase from him. That's because it's all about Jesus, and if it's not, we can't understand it. It's just words on a page, amen? We're called to redeem the time by preaching that to people. Now, most of the church don't know that, if you didn't know most of the church don't know that reading their Bible is, in, is an impossibility without seeing Jesus in it. That's what we, we, we have to do to understand the Bible. We may understand a, a parable, a passage, a truth of the Bible, a, a factual statement in the Bible. But once we try to live it out on our own, we'll soon begin to realize that there's not power in words on the page. You see, the written word's all about the living word. And the living word died for me and you to be able to be able to li live this written word. Because we're all called to. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 8. Redeeming the time it is more than just putting a, a scripture in your bio, bio biography on Facebook. How many of you know what that is? Bio on Facebook. <laughs> It's when you click on your profile and can see what, a few things it says about you. Most young people <clears throat> will have a scripture or something there. It's more than doing that. It's more than putting a bumper sticker on your car. It's more than just saying when you're asked, yes, I am a Christian. It's letting people know, making sure people know, yes, I serve Jesus. I serve God. <clears throat> I've heard a statement many times made, and there's a lot of truth to it, and it sounds good. <clears throat> preach the gospel, use words when necessary. That means preach the gospel with your lifestyle. But I've got, I've got a question for you today. What if words are always necessary? What if God wants us not to only live our lives for Him, but to also tell others about Him? You see, I don't, I don't see it as a black and white way of witnessing for Christ. There's not a do it this way or do it that way. We've always got to share Christ, but in the way we do it may be different. Mm -hmm. He may want you on your job just to live for Him so others can see you doing it and say, wow, after 10 years, that He's still a man of God. He's still a woman of God. Or He may call you to lead a prayer group to, to talk about Jesus, to stand up on the table and shout about Jesus. We're all different. But He's all called us to share Christ. God all wants us to share His Son because it's in His Son who's the direct representation of His own glory. Why do you think God the Father took so much pleasure in His Son? <clears throat> it's because He was a direct image of God's glory. He's the image of the invisible God, it tells us in Colossians 1.15. He's the image of the invisible God, the sustainer of all things, talking about Jesus the Son, and He's always been that. So God's always taken pleasure in Him. And when He came and He died on the cross for our sins, He said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He's not pleased in anything else. So if we're not showing Him to the world, here's, here's the, the honest, hard truth to accept. He's not <coughs> pleased with us. He's not pleased if we're not being a light for Him. That doesn't mean He's going to send you to hell. It doesn't mean He hates you. He loves you. If you can be saved and not be sharing Christ, but God's displeased in that and He wants us all to redeem the times. Amen? Amen. 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 I hope you agree with me. How many people are born again in here today? Yeah. All right. Some of you. Okay. Well, I, I, this is the truth. This is, a, this is a great truth to know and accept. <clears throat> How many of you know that God has made us actually co-laborers with Him? Yeah. Right. Look here with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. What an honor and a privilege it is to be co-laboring in the harvest field with God. The God who created everything. The God who created everyone. We are laborers together with Him. We are His representation in this world. We are what, we are what the world has and can see of God. Are we living like it? 
Are we acting like it? Are we sharing Him? Are we being faithful to His Word? You see, look in verse 8 here. Now that he that planteth and he that watereth are one. I, we were talking about this on the way up here. And this is my fiance, by the way, everybody, Rebecca Hoffman. It just as about a, almost not quite two weeks ago, maybe even a week ago. Been about a week ago. And we're excited and I'm blessed that she's here with me. Amen. That's a rabbit trail. A real one. <laughs> But verse 8 here says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We were talking about this and I was saying, Well, what does this mean? Because Paul says that some water, or some plant, some water, some seeds to this and that. And he said, I planted, Apollos watered, Peter did this and that. So they had different functions, but they're one. He said the one that plants and watereth are one. What does that mean? They're one. It means they share the same message. One faith, one message. One gospel. We share the same message. Paul said the one that plants and the one that waters. What does that tell me? It tells me that whenever we begin to preach the gospel to people who don't know it, we don't just do it for a short period of time and then move on to the do's and don'ts of the Bible. The do's and don'ts of the Bible can only be accomplished by knowing how to live for God. You see, this message of the cross, the great gospel of Jesus Christ that allows us and shows us how to be saved and also how to live for God is not just something we preach once or twice a year, like I said earlier. And there's a myth, and that's what it is. It's a myth, and it's a dangerous one. I feel like this is... Can y'all hear that? Can you hear me better now? I feel like it was rumbling all over the place. <laughs> There's a myth going around that we just have to preach the message of the cross, the gospel for a short season of time and then move on to better things or move on to deeper things. And listen, there's nothing deeper that God has for you than that. The reality is to learn the entirety of the Word of God, we have to learn it in that gospel context, in the context of Christ. And what he did. It's on every page. We don't move on from it because we can't. As humans, we'll forget. Hmm. And how do I know? It's because even though I'm still hearing how to live for God, I still mess up. So I still need to be hearing it. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> it says that we're co-laborers with God. And if God's message is this message of the cross, that has to be our message too. To not only the world, but most definitely the church age that we're experiencing now it is very corrupt. <coughs> probably the worst that it's ever been. I think we could all probably agree on that. We, we, don't, we don't even understand uh, uh, most of the church probably how to be born again and how to live for God. And those that do, a lot of, it, it's hard to, uh, a lot of people neglect it, neglect it and whatnot, but we still preach it. Because at some point people have to accept it and we've been in the place of rejecting it from time to time. But that's just... We're, we're in seasons, and, it's, and it's, it's never God's fault that we're rejecting His truth. Right. It's never God's fault that we're holding the truth in unrighteousness. Right. It's always our fault. Right. You see, God, He puts us through times and seasons always to grow us closer to Him in this truth. Mm -hmm. Look with me here. Uh, he that plants and waters are one. It's the same message. If all our words aren't found in righteousness concerning His Word, we're not co-laboring with God. And what does that mean, all of our words found in righteousness? I'm glad you asked. Could you turn with me to Romans chapter 3? <laughs> Romans chapter 3, <coughs> verse 24. <clears throat> Romans 3 verse 24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past 
through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes. Now stay with me here for a moment. Verse 25, talking about Jesus, says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, which means sacrifice, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. Now who is that talking about? To declare His righteousness. When you read this very carefully, it says, it, it, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness. It's saying that the sacrifice that Jesus made, the death that He died, declares the righteousness of God. It declares God's righteousness, His very death. And if we're found trusting in this place, we will also be declaring the righteousness of God. And why is this important? Why is the righteousness of God always mentioned? Why is it always brought up and talked about? This is how God speaks. This is how He works. This is how He moves through His righteousness. What does that mean exactly? <clears throat> and a lot of people, if we went around the room, would give right answers, great biblical answers. But there's a truth that I want to reveal to you today. That Proverbs 8 and 8, this is the Lord speaking and He says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. This is the Lord right through Solomon. He's pouring out through Solomon in Proverbs, and he says, For the word then he says, All of the words of my mouth are in righteousness. Hmm. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. That's God speaking there. And this scripture in Romans 3, verse 25 says, The death of Christ reveals and expresses His righteousness. It also says in Romans 1, 17 and 18 that the preaching of the gospel is the power of God and righteousness is revealed in the gospel. So if righteousness, stay with me for a minute because this is a great truth. And this, will, this if you understand that all of God's words are in righteousness, you will, be, you will be able to understand your Bible to live this Christian life victoriously. victoriously. Just listen, stay with me for a minute because I'm going to quote a few scriptures. Romans 1, 17 and 18. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The righteousness is revealed therein the gospel. And that gospel is the power of God. What else tells us what the power of God is? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The preaching of the cross is the power of God. <clears throat> so what is it? Is it the gospel or is it the <coughs> preaching of the cross? The gospel is the preaching of the cross. Right. And it says it is the power of God. It also says that righteousness is revealed in the gospel, which we now know from this other verse to mean the preaching of the cross. And Proverbs 8 and 8 tells us that all of God's words are found in righteousness. So what does that tell us? If righteousness is revealed in the preaching of the cross, and all of God's words are revealed in righteousness, where is God's voice revealed? In the preaching of the cross. It's revealed in the preaching of the Word in the context of Christ and what He did. That's the voice of God. That's the voice. You've got many people telling you today, this is how to understand the voice of God. This is how to hear God's voice. Dreams and visions and visions and dreams. Listen, if you're telling me more about your dreams and your visions than you're telling me about what the Lord showed you in His Word, you might be off track in your hearing of God's voice. There's nothing wrong with dreams and visions. They're biblical. But we ought to be reading the Word of God and pulling truths out of the Word of God. And we just saw that the only way we can do that is by understanding that God's voice speaks in righteousness and righteousness is revealed in the cross. Good. Verse 25, His death expresses His righteousness. You see, faith in His blood 
whom God has set forth to be a sacrifice of propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. The only way that we can redeem the time this morning and until we go home to be with glory is if we're preaching the only thing that can forgive sins. The only thing that can deliver from sin, from the dominion, from the penalty of sin, which is the cross of Christ. This is the only thing that shows forth the righteousness of God. Our works, our doings, our thoughts, our opinions, our made-up, man-made, all types of philosophical things do not express the righteousness of God. Simply preaching the gospel of Christ and Him crucified expresses His righteousness. And His righteousness in that is His voice is revealed to us. Do you see that this morning? <clears throat> I hope I explained that good enough to you to know that whenever God's speaking, it always involves the gospel. Right. Whenever God shows up, the cross is always involved. Right. We don't preach it because we heard others preach it, and we don't repeat things over and over just because we know it's right. We, repeat, we, we preach the cross, and, and we repeat how to live for God because it works. Amen. <clears throat> Why run from something that works? I'll tell you why people have quit preaching it and people have never preached it. It's because they don't. They, there's no pat on the backs in this message. That's what I heard Brother Lauren Larson say one time. It, the, the novelty of this message is wearing off because there's no pat on the backs. There, there, there's no uh, uh, link to great numbers and, 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 and crowds that will give us fame and for, fortune while you're preaching this message. A lot of people I, I've seen say, well, it's, you know, it's, if, you don't have, if you don't have a big crowd, you might not be in the will of God. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Actually, I see the opposite in the Bible. And I'm not saying the numbers can't grow. We're believing God that they will. But when Jesus in John chapter 6 started telling people, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, it said everybody went home that day but the twelve. Everybody went home but the twelve. Many left that day. It's not a fun road sometimes. It's a lonely road. You can be sitting in a room and be lonely on this cross walk. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You can be around a thousand people and feel alone, but you're not alone. That's right. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, <clears throat> this you know, all of Asia has forsaken me. <laughs> Paul said that. The Apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, who's responsible for all of our understanding of the New Covenant, God used this man tremendously, and as I've always thought of Paul in my life, Paul was just the man. Everybody followed Paul. Everybody loved Paul. He had a huge following, huge support base, right? Don't we think of that about Paul that way, a great man of God? He told Timothy, all have left me in Asia. And do you know what was in Asia in that day? The seven churches. That John wrote to. Paul said everybody left me Timothy. No man stood with me at my first hearing. You see I fear that the church today. Would not stand with the imprisoned apostle Paul. If Paul was here today. Many say wow wouldn't it be something. Just to hear him preach. Just to pack out an auditorium. There wouldn't be an auditorium packed out. With Paul preaching. <laughs> If you think some people preaching the cross nowadays are narrow, you ought to read the words of Jesus. You ought to read the words of Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul was determined. He said, all of Asia left me. No man stood with me. Let that sink in. This road doesn't promise you fame. It doesn't promise you many friendships. and It doesn't promise you money. <clears throat> it promises you abundant life. And those who have been in the deeps and the depths and the deepest parts of sin know that abundant, victorious life is greater than anything that the world has to offer. Those that have been lost 
in sin, couldn't quit doing that thing that they know displeased God, and finally saw that His blood was enough to take that away, to set you on the right course, to turn you in from an old man to a new creation, bent toward the things of God. Nobody that has been changed in that sense, nobody, nobody looks at the world, world and says, Oh, I want to go back to my sin. I want to go back to my struggle and the way I felt. Now, you can be pulled away, <clears throat> but nobody desires to feel the way they used to feel. It's other things that draw us away. But as we begin to look to that cross and what Jesus did for us up there when we were in that place, and He reached down and rescued us from our sin, the question is, why would we ever leave that? God doesn't want us to. You see, it's the only avenue He speaks through. Mm -hmm. It's the only avenue His words, His voice is revealed in. His word is revealed in. Mm -hmm. That's the only avenue. And as we take this word, <clears throat> we see in, here in Romans 3 verse 25 where we've been for, for the past few minutes that His death declares His righteousness. So if we're found in Him, if we're found living the crucified life, Paul talks about in Galatians 2.20, our lives express the righteousness of God to the entire world. You see, we're all called to preach. We're not all called to stand up behind a pulpit and uh, assume the, the role of uh, a preacher, uh, but we are all called to preach the gospel with our daily lives. Jesus didn't leave anybody out of the Great Commission. He said, go you and preach the gospel to every creature, to every, every city, every nation, to the utmost parts of the earth, he said in Acts. Are we doing that? Are we leaving this place with the zealousness to take the gospel out? Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 26, I believe it is, that we ought to be living a life worthy of the gospel. <clears throat> We ought to be living a life that's worthy of this great gospel we've been given. Can we say that this morning? None of us are perfect. We all fall short. But we can live lives that every single fiber in our being is striving toward the mark, the high calling, the prize of Christ Jesus. Because if we're not going to tell people about Jesus, who's going to? If we're not going to show the world the only way out of sin, the only way from a road to hell, who's going to do it? Amen. We've got to show the world Christ. We've got to show forth His righteousness. And the only way we can do that is by being found planted and risen in His death. Amen. Planted in His death, <coughs> risen with victorious life, living unto Jesus Christ. We've got to be redeeming the times. The days are very evil. Yes. Very evil. Amen. 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 And as we as we begin to live for God and share God, we're we're going to face opposition. I promise. God God's not he, He's not going to leave you all alone though. He's not, just like He didn't leave Paul. All Paul still had people with him. But listen, if if he if he ever if he would ever even left him all alone, you still have the gospel. You still have the greatest companion there is. Amen. <clears throat> If we're not sharing His gospel to the world, we're not following His command of being a city set on a hill. When you see a city up on a high hill going on vacation, driving wherever you're driving to, you don't forget it. I, we were just talking earlier about there's high schools that you remember the funny names of when you're driving places like Assumption High School down here. And you, you remember towns and the names of towns when you're driving long distances and places like that. And you remember those cities, those nice cities that you see. <clears throat> you see, people should be re remembering you throughout their life. That person was truly a city set up on a hill. That person really was different. That person was kinder. That person was more giving. That person was... He, he always talked about Jesus. And it doesn't mean they're not going to see you fail. Listen, don't, don't let fear of failure hold you back from preaching the gospel. Yeah. At school, at your job, at the church. <clears throat> you may think wherever you're at, well, these people know my past. 
these people know how I just acted last week. If I start telling them about Jesus, they're going to think I'm a hypocrite. Listen, if we all had that mindset, none of us could preach. Amen. None of us should be able to share it. That's right. Peter denied Jesus three times, and then he preached the great one of the greatest sermons ever on the day of Pentecost. Right. Amen. 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 God wants to use you to redeem the time. Nobody's left out of that. Man, woman, child, black, white. No, nobody's left out of God's command for you to take the gospel to the world. Don't let anybody discourage you from going out and from sharing. Don't let anybody say you talk about it too much. You, you live it too much. You're just taking the Jesus thing too seriously. You're just taking the cross thing too seriously. Nobody wants to hear all that stuff. I do. God does. That's what God's saying. Through His voice is coming through His righteousness, speaking the same thing that it spoke from the foundation of the earth, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation. You see, heaven, when we get there, <clears throat> it's not going to be... It's, we're, we're not going to be doing anything... We're not going to be praising anything different, praising anybody different. Heaven's all about the Lamb. They're all praising the slain Lamb. You see... In the, the scene in the book of Revelation when John is seeing <clears throat> Jesus take the sealed book, one of the most powerful scenes, he doesn't just see Jesus the Son, he sees Him as the Lamb slain. Yeah. One of the most powerful scenes in all of the Bible, in all of the times that we'll, have, we'll, we'll ever be and will be there, amen, is Jesus as the slain Lamb opening up the seals. Why is He as the slain Lamb? Why, why, why did he have to do it as the slain lamb? Because God only does things through that way. God only works through that sacrifice. His righteousness is only expressed through that sacrifice. His voice is only spoken through that cross. Psalms 33, 4 says, All my works are done in truth, for the word of the Lord is right, and all God's works are done in truth. His works, His voice, His moving, His operation, His love, everything you need from God is experienced there at Calvary. Romans 8.32 He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for you also, how will He also not with Him freely give you all things? He that spared not His own Son, that's talking about God giving Jesus on the cross, how shall He not with Him that's also referring to what He did. Freely give you all things. That's not just talking about blessings. That's talking about everything you need to live for Him. Listen, once you start receiving from God, from Calvary, with your faith planted there, believing, reckoning that to be true in your heart, you'll start receiving stuff from God. And once you do, don't walk away thinking that, okay, now I have to go to this place to receive from Him. No, the verse says all things. He will freely give you all things with Him because He spared Him not. If you'll stay at the foot of the cross, you can be so close to God, you can be as close to God as you want to be. You know that? You can be as close. That, that's such a powerful truth. Listen, you may not be called to do this or that. You may not be called to preach, but just because you're not behind a pulpit or because you're not pastoring a church or overseas being a missionary or whatever you think that's just, that's it. Just because you're not doing that doesn't mean you can't have the best relationship with God. That, that position, that power, that platform, it doesn't get you any closer to God. Not in your heart. The only thing that will get you closer to God is dying more to yourself today and living unto Him. Yeah, that's right. Reckoning yourself to be dead indeed unto sin is what Paul calls it. He says reckon yourself to be dead there in Romans 6 unto sin and alive to Jesus Christ. That's our lives. We, we, we reckon. We reckon ourselves and we redeem the time. That's what we're still here for. We shouldn't get caught up in a phase in a time of just saying, well, I believe the Lord's coming back soon. I'm just, I've got my bags packed now. I'm just waiting any day now. I, I, I'm believing that. I really believe that He's coming back very, very 
very, very soon. Yeah. But yeah. that that should drive us even more so to be telling folk yes. about Him. Listen, <clears throat> when you truly get closer to the Lord, everybody talks about being on fire for God and, and burning for Jesus and, and all that. Well, that burning inside of you, if you don't let it come out, what's it there for? Mm -hmm. When we get on fire for God, when we catch a fire and, and, and start living for Him, we'll also start showing forth His righteousness, showing forth His death. Because that's the only way we can show forth God. That's the image of God to us. Yeah. We just saw Romans 8, 32. All things of God, even God Himself, are received through what He did at Calvary. So when we look to Him, that's what we see. When we pray in Jesus' name as we were commanded to by the Son... We're saying because of what you did. Because what is the name of Jesus? Yeshua, Savior. You see, everything we receive comes through that same avenue. Yeah. And by trusting in that, He'll give us the grace. He'll give us the boldness, the courage to share Him on the job, at school, at work, at church, wherever we are, out on the street. You know, I'm, I'm baffled as I see people striving with all their ability to learn all these things. Like, like, I, like I was mentioning at the beginning, I call them the cool things of the Bible. Interesting things about the Word of God. We all know they're there, cool stories, stuff like that. People strive and dig, and that's all, that's all we really talk about. Meanwhile, there's people walking by us on the street who are just so far hooked on sin. They need somebody to share the light with them. How can we be so spend all of our time so invested in so much learning and not telling anybody that needs it about Jesus? Yeah. We we've, we've got to have we've got to have a mindset of pulling everybody with us to heaven. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I want to pull everybody that I see with me to heaven. And don't just think it's enough just to live your lifestyle. Use words. Redeem the time. Purchase all that time. We need to be using all the time necessary. I promise you, nothing else is more important. That's nothing right. else is more important. Yeah, that's right. Pursuing your dream career is not more important than redeeming the time. And, and once you get a hold of that truth, God will change your heart to be more about Him than more about you. Amen. Because if you don't understand the cross, the most selfless act of all time, you, you will be the most prideful person. You will be the most confused person. But there at Calvary, He made it so simple that we can die to all that pride and live unto Him. A humble life. Not, not a perfect life, but a humble life. If, if the church would serve each other, everybody running around serving everybody, nobody would be lording over anybody. There would be no mastership. We'd all be serving Christ and serving each other. And then it would pour over into the world like a fountain. Like an overflowing fountain. And that's, that's what I want from myself. That's what I want from everybody here today. I felt like the Lord wanted me to, to share that with you today. And share that with the church. It's just been on my heart so much lately that we ought to be a burning light for Jesus. For the whole world to see. Because the days are surely getting darker. But this light is it's not shining brighter we're just now seeing just how bright it is. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> just when I when I dwelling on that word and 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 everything that was just said, we we need to realize that trying our hardest in our own strength and doing everything we possibly can to wake up tomorrow and to say, I just want to go share Jesus today. I want to live for you. I want to be perfect. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that today. That's not how it's done. It's a rest. It's a resting process. You see, we've got to learn how to rest. And it may sound funny to you, but one of the hardest things you'll ever do is learn how to rest. Amen. Learn how to rest in Christ. But He gives yeah. you grace along this journey. Yes. He gives you grace to know more of Him. To understand Him that we may show Him forth to the entire world. Amen.
I want to open up these altars today to anybody who just wants to be encouraged from God to share the gospel. If you feel like you, you, you want the Lord to stir you up to go out into the world to preach the gospel, I'm not talking about overseas, though you might. I'm just talking about sharing Him every chance you get. If that's you today, just receive from the Lord. Amen.